Hello Risen, and welcome to Vermont. You've lost your memory, Queen Disa is on some royal bullshit, and you're heading out on the adventure of a lifetime. Before you do though, there are a lot of things that you should be familiar with. Some things Dragon's Dogma 2 will teach you up front, while others will take a bit of digging to figure out. In order to give you the best start possible, we figured we'd tell you everything you need for the opening hours in this one convenient package. So let's get started. Now that you've spent about two hours on character creation, don't worry, we're not judging you. It's time to finally pick your class, which in this world is considered your vocation. This may feel like a daunting task, especially with the game's lack of multiple character slots, but don't take this initial vocation choice too seriously. I say this because Dragon's Dogma 2 wants you to experiment with the different vocations in the game, and you'll only be stuck with the first one you choose until you reach the city of Melv. Depending on how much you get sidetracked, it'll take about an hour from that first cutscene until you reach Melv. And the trip there has just enough combat to let you know if you love or hate the choice of vocation you made. Once you get to Melv, you'll encounter the Vocation Guild, a location where you can purchase new vocations, weapon skills, core skills, and augments using discipline. But similar to experience points, discipline is acquired by defeating enemies and completing quests. The good news is that even an Arisen with very little discipline can find the vocation that fits their playstyle, because these classes and their skills are not very expensive at the start of the game. There will also be a limited selection for you to choose from at first, thus eliminating some of the decision paralysis and the need to go into discipline credit card debt. The early vocations include Fighter, Mage, Archer, and Thief. Fighter is your standard sword and board type of class that is the perfect match for players that want to spend a lot of time blocking and a lot of time parrying. Mage is the first magic class that spellbinders can get their hands on, and it is great for the patient player that doesn't mind the time that it takes to incant a spell. Archer is the sharpshooter that packs a bow as its main weapon. This vocation is perfect for the player that doesn't want to be right in the heart of the action, but wants more attack speed than the mage provides. Best guard or dodge, else you'll be sore on the morrow. And Thief is the dagger daddy, the movement mommy, and my personal favorite in the game. This vocation is perfect for the player that leans into dodging when in a skirmish. Oh, and did I mention that the dodge doesn't cost any stamina? So spam that button whenever you need and get out of harm's way. All of the vocations have 10 levels of mastery for you to progress through that are separate from your character's level. And these levels aren't just a fancy new number and a cool looking animation on screen. Each new vocation level unlocks different skills unique to that vocation. Unfortunately though, unless you check with the vocation guild after each level up, there isn't an easy way to see what each level unlocks. There aren't grayed out options in the menus with a padlock and a number beside it, just empty space that is filled when you're the proper level. However, you don't have to worry about that too much right now, because for this video, we're only covering the first level of these vocations. The categories of the skills you'll be unlocking and purchasing with discipline come in three different flavors, weapon skills, core skills, and augments. Weapon skills are active skills that are equipped and placed into one of four available slots. These skills can be swapped for different ones at any time, but not on the fly. In order to change what you have equipped, you'll need to be at a vocation guild or a campfire, and you don't even need any camping gear to do it. Core skills are also active, but unlike weapon skills, they do not need to be equipped in order to use them. Augments are passive special abilities that can be equipped regardless of your current vocation. For example, the metal augment belongs to the fighter, but it can be added to any of the other vocations as well as mixed and matched with augments from those other vocations. Early on, it seems metal was the only augment available. So at level one, I'd suggest unlocking that if you have the fighter and tossing it into whatever vocation you're planning to main at the moment. As for the other categories, here are the best skills to grab early. When it comes to weapon skills, fighters should grab blink strike Compass Slash, and Shield Bash. Mages only have four options available at level one, so I'd suggest grabbing them all and filling each empty slot. Archers should grab Barrage Shot, Sweep Shot, Dire Arrow, and Exploding Shot. And finally, 
Thieves only have three options available at level one, so similar to my advice with the mage, grab them all. In the core skills category, fighters should grab this tongue twister of a name, Tusk Toss, and Steeled Foundation. Mages only have one option, Focused Bolt, so take it. Archers have two at the start that do nearly the same thing, and my favorite of the two is Parting Shot. There's four in this clip because it's from later in the game. Thieves only have one option called Scarlet Kisses that I briefly mentioned earlier. It's a must have. And although it may be easy to forget, please make sure you purchase and equip the different skills for your pawn as well. There's no need to be selfish, they have their own amount of discipline to pull from. If you happen to have some extra discipline once you've chosen the vocation you want and the skills you want, I'd suggest grabbing whatever other vocations you can afford as well. You don't have to equip them right away, but having each one early can give you a little wiggle room to experiment and figure out which one you prefer. Just be careful because getting the new vocations gives you all of the equipment for it and tosses it right into your pack. If you don't put the ones you're not using into storage, you'll become over encumbered very fast. But not to worry, we'll go over items and storage in the next section. Inventory management can sometimes be a pain in the ass, but hopefully this section of the guide can make things a little bit easier on you. At the start of the game, you are able to hold a decent amount of weight in your pockets, and that includes the items that you have equipped as well. Your pawns also have a limit, but their capacities may differ from yours at the start, specifically the ones you hire from another player. The more you have in your pockets and the heavier the items are, the heavier your character becomes. Simple. The heavier your character is, the faster your stamina will drop when you're running or in combat. This is the case unless you're in town, because stamina doesn't drain at all when you're not out in the open world. The best way to lighten your load is to take advantage of the storage at the inns. However, if you're nowhere near town and your pockets are weighing you down, you do have some temporary options to choose from. The first one is to give some of the items to your pawns. For example, camping kits are very heavy and will ruin your day if you're carrying them by yourself, so I like to spread out the ones I had amongst my party. My other tip for emptying your pockets is by combining the items that you're carrying. When using the game's combining system, you can either make use of recipes you've already discovered, or you can experiment with the materials in order to find new combinations that lead to potentially more powerful items. This method isn't perfect, but as you can see, combining a few items managed to lower my overall weight, while other combos increased my weight by as little as between 0.05 kilograms and 0.10 kilograms. My favorite tip for inventory management yields permanent results, but it may take a while to see a big change. Always be on the lookout for golden trove beetles. These shiny little bugs can be used to increase your carry capacity by 0.15 kilograms. I'm not quite sure if they're in the same spot for everyone or if they pop up randomly around the world as you play, but train yourself to spot them. And another way I managed to snag some of these was to make it the reward for my pawn quests something we'll speak more about in a later section. But your pockets won't just be filled with random crap like apples and monster tails. There will also be plenty of weapons and armor sets making their way in and out. Vocations are great, but they're nothing without their equipment. And Dragon's Dogma 2 does a great job at telling you which pieces of equipment can be used by a vocation at a glance. When looking at the item's description, you'll notice the little logos for the vocations that can utilize it. And if that wasn't enough, there's also a little red box near the picture of the item in your inventory that indicates when you can't use it. Weapons and armor are great, but they're even better when they're enhanced. And conveniently, enhancements for both types of equipment can be done at either shop. For example, you don't need to be at the armory to boost your armor, and you don't need to be at the blacksmith in order to boost your weapons. Enhancing your equipment is incredibly easy, especially when it's your first time doing so for that piece of equipment. This is because the first enhancement will not cost you any materials, just a small amount of gold. When you're ready to enhance your equipment even further, you'll need different types of materials alongside the gold in order to do so. The great thing is that you do not have to have those materials on hand. The armory or the blacksmith can pull from the storage at the inn as well as your pawn's pockets to fulfill the requirement, assuming you have the right things in storage, that is. This allowed me to keep my character fairly light, but still up upgrade items whenever I needed to while saving myself a trip to the inn. And speaking of trips, let's finally talk about some exploration 
because you'll be doing a whole lot of it. I hope your character has a good pair of shoes because you're in for the workout of a lifetime. Dragon's Dogma 2 has a fast travel system, but it's fairly limited, especially at the start of your adventure. The first choice you have for moving a bit quicker is by using the ox carts. These are slow moving carts that can take you from town to town for a small fee. You can either sit and watch the whole trip take place, which I'm curious how many players are actually going to do that, or you can choose doze off to take a nap in the cart and wake up at your destination. The option to doze isn't always instant, however. Sometimes the cart will be ambushed by enemies and you'll need to fight before climbing back aboard and dozing off again. And make sure you fight away from the cart, because it can be destroyed. The ox cart will always depart from a town at a certain time, but you don't always have to catch it there. I've bumped into the carts plenty of times while out in the wilderness traveling on a main road. This isn't how you'll be starting a trip 90% of the time, but if the cart just happens to be going the way you're going, feel free to hop on in the middle of a trip. Unfortunately though, the cart doesn't show up on the map, so there's no way to track it down when you're out in the wild. It's quite literally just right place, right time if you're using this method. The other way to get around the map faster is by using fairy stones. These stones will instantly teleport you to the port crystal of your choosing. At the start of your journey, port crystals can be found in major cities and towns, but can be placed on your own later in the game. The two downsides to fairy stones are that they are an item that when used, they're gone. It is not the type of magical item that can be reused over and over following a cooldown. The other downside is that they don't work in caves or underground. You'll need to make your way out into the open air before the stone can work its magic. So yeah, fast travel is available, but it's pretty limited like I said. So here are some things to keep in mind as you inevitably walk around. Shallow water is fine. Deep water is bad. This is because a creature called the brine lives in the deep rivers, lakes, and the sea. Dragon's Dogma 2 demonstrates this well with an early death, but I found it easy to forget once the exploration got into full swing. Rest in peace to the pawns I lost to the brine. You were all great help. And speaking of unnecessary deaths, take nighttime seriously when you first start exploring. This advice is extra important if you fall into one or both of these categories. The first one is if you've taken a fair amount of damage during the day and your maximum health has taken a significant hit. This is called your loss gauge and it gets worse the more damage you take and stops you from regaining full health even if you down a bunch of potions. You'll need to rest in order to get your max health back. The other reason I suggest you take nighttime seriously is if you are far from town without camping gear or fairy stones. This second one isn't too pressing, but if you do have the combo of being far from town, no travel options, and a high loss gauge, you could be in for an annoying night. Especially if your game auto saves right next to a group of phantoms that are kicking your ass because your gauge is too high. That was me. You can keep an eye out on the time of day by looking into the sky, of course, or you can hit the pause button and look at the ring around the map, which is nicely illustrated with day and night and rotates as the time progresses in the game. And finally, if you see an exclamation mark on your mini map, it means that one of your pawns is trying to show you something. At first, this can be very confusing if you're used to other RPGs and assume it's some NPC with a side quest or something, but nope. It's just a ladder that your pawn is really, really excited about. There's a ladder here. Ah, excellent find. And that mark on the map is pretty good, but if you hear your pawn offering to help you find something, make sure you give the go command so that they can take the lead with their idea. Otherwise, they might just stand there pointing awkwardly. And that brings us to our final section all about your loyal helpers, the pawns. Up front, I just want to let you know that at launch, there is unfortunately no option to lower their chatter in the settings. Dare I say it? We trounced our foe, well and true. We mustn't allow ourselves to become complacent. Take each trial as it comes. I'm so sorry in advance. Anyway, early on, I found it very helpful to hire pawns that would complete my party by offering vocations that my main pawn and myself were not using. Support pawns can come from a couple of different places. The first is from rift stones. These magic rocks give you more of a choice in what you're looking for in order to complete your party. 
Forgotten Rift Stones can offer the same, but sometimes interacting with them doesn't restore them. Instead, a random high level pawn will spawn and give you the option to hire them there on the spot. Do or don't, the Rift Stone remains become unusable afterward. The other way you'll encounter support pawns is out in the world, and these pawns will scare the life out of you when they randomly stop you in your tracks, shove their resume into your hands, pledging their loyalty to you without even saying hi first. But no matter what way you hire a pawn, here are some of the things you should know about them. For starters, they all have one of four inclinations. Kind-hearted pawns prioritize support in battle and are quick to run to your aid. Calm pawns are strategic in battle and favor being defensive and evasive. Simple pawns are very curious and tend to gather items and explore the area on their own. And finally, straightforward pawns are impulsive and will run straight into the battle without a care in the world. Alongside these inclinations, pawns also have specializations, but we're not going to dive into that for this guide as they didn't affect me too much early on. Now before I leave you, I want to talk about Pawn Quests, the feature that I think might get overlooked by some. Pawn Quests are tasks that you assign to your created pawn for them to complete with other players, real players, that hire them via the Rift Stones. The task can be to earn a pawn badge, a reward that can make your pawn more attractive to those wanting to hire them for something specific, or it can just be to acquire items. As I mentioned earlier, I typically chose to make my pawn's task about getting an item, the gold trove beetles. So I'd set my request from other player as five trove beetles, and my reward to that other player in exchange was around 5,000 gold. It felt fair, and other players must have agreed because I got this trade to happen around twice before writing this video. Saved me some time hunting for beetles and got me more carry capacity. Win-win. The other plus to Pawn Quest is the player that hired them must give them a parting gift and a rating before they go. So depending on how nice that other player was, you can get something useful as a gift. Oh, and don't worry, quests don't cause your pawn to disappear from your world. They'll always be with you. But then one day you'll wake up from sleeping at the inn and they'll come to you and tell you how great their adventure was and show you what they got. Like, yo, when, when did you do this? <laughs> well, Arisen, that's it. That's all I have to teach you for today. If there's anything you'd like to share with your fellow adventurers, please do so in the comments below. Good luck on your journey, and thanks for watching.